Chris Kelsey here with Matt Howell. On this episode of The First Run, Technical Issues Be Damned, we're going to discuss Hobbs and Shaw, the spin off of the Fast and Furious franchise. Because when you can team up The Rock and Jason Statham, you're maybe going to have some magic. And then you're going to catch up with another just legendary pairing Will Farrell and John C. Riley return. And this time it's for last winter's comedy extravaganza, Helms and Watson. And then finally, Matt and I are going to share our five favorite spinoff films. So let's start everything off with a clip from our good old buddies, Hobbs and Shaw. Let me put it this way. Everything that I'm about to talk about with this film is perfectly encapsulated by what you're about to hear. I'm dealing with the future of the planet. I'm the necessary shock to the system. I am human evolutionary change. Bulletproof. Superhuman. Who the hell are you? Bad guy. The mission has been compromised. We need help. Our target's name is Brixton. He's a ghost. We're gonna need the best trackers in the business. Luke Hobbs. I'm what you call an ice cold can of whoop ass. Career lawman. Always gets his guy. We're gonna need to operate outside the system. Deckard Shaw. I'm what you might call a champagne problem. Rogue former MI6 agent. Doesn't play well with others. If we stand a chance against Brixton, you guys have to work together. No way. This guy's a real ass. Matt, Hobbs and Shaw. Mm. So Dwayne Johnson and Jason Statham's characters from the last run of Fast and Furious movies are tasked with stopping a woman who may have gone bad and stolen a deadly virus. But they're really, all three of them team up. Of course, that woman played by Vanessa Kirby who recently kind of shot to the front with her turn in Mission Impossible Fallout. All three of them end up teaming up against Idris Elba's Brixton Lore, who is our black Superman, as he calls himself in the film. A nigh-indestructible supervillain improved by technology, I guess, right? So, Matt, let me ask you a question about Hobbs and Shaw. How dumb is too dumb? We may be asking this question more than once um, on this show, um, but... Uh... Yeah, I think we're we're if we haven't crossed the line, we're we're right up against it with Hobbs and Shaw. It's 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 real close um, to be too dumb. Saying it's not maybe kind of generous, and I don't know if I'm being a generous mood tonight. There's always the crowd out there who says, "Let's listen, just turn off your brain and enjoy the ride," right? Yeah. And the Fast and Furious films basically have perfected that. I think perhaps maybe too far at this point. <laughs> We all look back lovingly on that one. I can't remember which one it was now, where they had that runway scene with a the plane they're chasing, and that runway just goes on for miles and miles. <laughs> it's a 20 minute conclusion in a film on a runway. Right. So, and just, or the one where they leap the, the car from building to building yep. through the skyscrapers. I mean, just the franchise is just mwah, it's the chef's kiss of ridiculous. <laughs> And I think one of the fun things about those movies, too, has been the interactions between Dwayne Johnson and Statham. Now, these are both two charismatic guys, two guys that I love to see in action films. So, though I was a little hesitant of this spinoff from the franchise, I got to admit, part of me was like, well, you know what? At least it'll be kind of fun. But I I was very, very wrong. It, it's... I find myself laughing at this a lot just because the absolutely insane action scenes and specifically just about how preposterous they were. Like there's scenes, I think to perfectly capture it, there's a scene where the rock jumps out of a building, a skyscraper to chase our bad guy. Right. And he's sliding down, holding these ropes as he goes down the building with no gloves, just his bare hands, just right. free falling, basically just using this rope to, to guide himself down this thing like his hands wouldn't be torn to shreds and then he lets go to jump on top of these bad guys one at a time to take them out as they try and get to idris elba's character there's a the one scene where the car goes up that fallen railing thing on an angle and then kind of is able to 
stay. And then possibly my favorite, which I think should somehow become a meme. I just don't know how to do it. Is The Rock holding a helicopter with a chain while holding on to the back of a truck. Remember the scene yeah. in, is it Civil War? Where yes. Is Captain yeah, America is holding on to the helicopter and the yeah. base of the... It's basically kind of like that. Except mm-hmm. Dwayne Johnson's just Dwayne Johnson. Now, I get that he's supposed to be basically like some unstoppable force. That he's basically a superhero <laughs> incarnate, but without any superpowers. But right. this thing, it just goes way too far for me. It, it is just patently ridiculous. And the other problem, too, is that the best thing about this 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 group is the interactions between the two characters. And it gets old really effing fast. Yes, it does. And the banter just it just it just doesn't work. It's not as funny. It's good for the first ten minutes, maybe, but it's just it's just tiresome. What are your thoughts? Am I wrong about this? No, you're absolutely right. It, it was basically eye roll cringe uh, throughout the whole thing. I mean, you even heard just some of the you know the delicious bon mots in the in the uh, trailer. I mean, I'm opening up a I'm a big cold can of whoop ass or something like that, and that's that's really about as as high as funny and high highbrow as it gets throughout this whole thing. And it's just we got Kevin Hart showing up for some reason. Um, you know, uh, it's it's I, yeah. And then all I can kept thinking about is when I'm watching this, it's like man. It just Elba is better than this. He is really slumming it on this one. I get understand you got to get a paycheck, get a part of you know, get a little entry into a big franchise. But he could have done way better, way better. Yeah, I feel too like the script and its plot points because there's really almost no script. The film mm-hmm. just basically barrels from action set piece to action set piece, and it doesn't give any any of its characters any really interesting moments or dialogue or room to breathe. But I feel like this whole thing. I think I wrote this in middle school, right? Like I worked out these story beats, talking to my buddy, like, it would be awesome. What if we did this? And that's basically <laughs> what this movie is. I, it's, it's like the it's like the Schwarzenegger Stallone movie you always wanted when you were in middle school. I guess Just so. To place to in. I, I I guess so. It's and one of the things you get too is why is why is Shaw a good guy now? Didn't he kill Han Lu in one of the in the, one of the uh, films? Right. Uh, honestly, I couldn't tell you. I am my Fast and Furious knowledge is is very slim. I, I haven't even seen maybe half of them. Yeah, well, I've seen them all, so I made a mission to see. Well, actually, have I seen Tokyo Drift? I don't think I have, but I've seen all the main ones. Mm. So, Matt, this whole thing is inane and pointless, and it's insane. It really it is. It, it is goes. It's it's absolutely an insane film. And like you said, they add Idris Elba and Vanessa Kirby, I think, kind of the, the, to bring it up a bit. But they don't do anything interesting with them. It's almost it's like they throw them in the scrambler just to see what comes out, too. Yeah. I get that big, dumb action movies can be fun, but, man, I, I always just kept waiting for this thing to end. And it just at one point, I was looking at my watch, and I'm like, wait, no. There's no <laughs> way. I still got 40 minutes to go with this thing. <laughs> So ultimately, yeah. for me, this is like a little bit goes a long way. The movie. Right. I think it may have been a, in the studio bigwigs. Going, How do we cash in on this this somewhat interesting dynamic between Dwayne Johnson and Jason Statham? Why not? Let's give them their own movie. And, and I got to tell you, I think I brought this up the last like subpar rock film. How many more of these does he have in him? He is not, he is not making good movies. Like, I think... No. Jumanji was a lot of fun. I'm actually kind of looking forward to the second Jumanji. I haven't seen um, that yet. Yeah, you should watch it. You should check it out. It's actually pretty good. But that's that's it. I mean, really, that's the only thing I can think of that I actually enjoyed that he was in. I dare I say I enjoyed him in Pain and Gain, even though that's a... Mm. Uh, I didn't see that. I haven't seen that. Snitch so. wasn't bad. Faster. Is that the one where he plays the guy with... The, yeah. With Billy Bob Thornton, that one is entertaining in a kind of uh, a raw kind of actioner kind of way. That one's okay, but I'm looking at this J. J. Retaliation, Fast and Furious Six, Hercules, Furious Seven, San Andreas, Central Intelligence, which I confess I haven't seen, Fate of the Furious, Baywatch. Oh God, Baywatch was bad. <laughs> Rampage, Skyscraper, bad. Fighting with My Family. He's not really. That's not his film. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know if we're ever going to get that Black Adam movie with him. I hope so, but he doesn't really have, he doesn't have, we still doesn't have that iconic role. You he know, doesn't. that movie, like, that's The Rock's movie. That's Dwayne Johnson's yeah. movie. And he's, I think he's running out, the clock's running, baby. How old is he now? It's got to be in his 50s, right? Let's see what the magic Google machine 40s? says. 40s? Late 40s? 47. Okay. Clock's ticking, baby. How old was Arnie when he did the Terminator? Young. He was like in his 20s? Let's see. So 1984 is when it came out. He was born in 1947. So what is that, 34? Yeah. Really? Wow. No, 37. He was 37, right? Is that the math? I got a C student. No, that, that can't be right. Uh, hold on. 1984. This is really entertaining. <laughs> 1947. I want 47, you to keep it in. Yeah, 37. 30, yeah, he was 37. He was 37 when he did the original Terminator? Yeah. Holy s***. <laughs> that there is crazy. So, okay. There you are. So, anything else to add about Hobbs and Shaw? Not really. I mean, um, I think... Anybody who wanted to see this film probably already went out and saw it. I think it's going to drop off a cliff. I don't even know how well it did at the box office. But honestly, unless you're like a like have a high tolerance for these kind of dumb action movies, and you think that the Fast and Furious franchise is still you know getting better or at least maintaining the quality it has been from whatever it peaked for number five or four or whatever it was, yeah, I can't recommend this to anybody to go see this. I, I would give it a D plus. I think. That's exactly what I gave it. How awesome is that? Yeah. So it costs 200, 200 to make. It's pulled in 193, honey. It's underwater, but it's only been out a week. Yeah. So it'll, 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 I think it'll turn a fine profit, and I think digital and Blu-ray sales will be good. Yeah, well, they're not making any big, uh, any big competition this week. So. Yeah. So it'll probably win the weekend again, I bet. Man, D-plus is around. I don't know. I just, it's too bad. I don't know if it's too bad. And I had no real investment in this thing. If you had a chance to see The Fast and Furious, Hobbs and Shaw, shoot us an email at feedback at thefirstrun.com. Coming up on the Blu-rays and the DVDs this upcoming Tuesday, Matt. Well, I think there's really only one film anybody cares about. Hey, Cap. I'm low. I just got a call from the secretary. I'm going to be running point on the scepter. Sir, I don't understand. We got word there may be an attempt to steal it. Sorry, Cap. We can't give you the scepter. I'm going to have to call the director. That's okay. Trust me. Bill Hydra. That was America's ass. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Avengers Endgame is getting its physical release. It's been available digitally for about a week now, maybe two. Yeah. You can get it at, from Best Buy with a steel book. Target's got a digipack. Uh, from what I understand, it does not feature Dolby Atmos um, or Dolby, what do you call it? The video part, the visual. The Okay. I don't know. It doesn't have it, which I think is bizarre. It's a 4K release, yet it's not going to have, I think, the Dolby Atmos soundtrack or the Dolby fork full, you know, HDR thing. I don't know. I don't know if right. they're, they're pocketing that for a later release to kind of double dip. But there's a bunch of special features, including six deleted scenes, a gag reel, audio commentary by the Russos, as well as the writers. There's a bunch of stuff on this. I'm on the fence. I'm we're, we now that we've met, we've we've passed the year. We're halfway through the year. Now I start thinking about Black Friday. And I'm like, ooh, do I wait for Endgame for Black Friday? The problem, too, with the Disney films is that they, even when they're cheap, they're not cheap. I know. Yeah, that's one of the big problems I've had with the whole Marvel films. You used to be able to pick up some of those earlier ones before they got bought by Disney for relatively cheap. Now they're never under, like, $20. Like, you never see them under $20. It's too bad. But now's your chance to own a physical copy. Also being released on 4K for the first time. Iron Man 2, 3, and the Thors, all are Best Buy Steelbooks, as well as an Avengers set you're going to be able to pick up too. So all the Avenger films will be in 4K in a specific set this upcoming Tuesday. 
the uh, film Shadow by director Zhang Mao, who also released House of the Flying Daggers and Hero, is being released in Blu-ray and in 4K. Yamao, once again, Matt, pushes the boundaries of Waxiao. How do you say that? Waxio action. I, I I don't know. I always said Waxio. I have Waxio. no. That's probably not even right. He creates a film like no other, masterfully painting a canvas of inky blacks and grays, punctuated with bursts of color from the blood of the defeated. In a kingdom ruled by a young and unpredictable king, the military commander has a secret weapon: a shadow, a lookalike who can fool both his enemies and even the king himself. Now he must use this weapon in an intricate plan that will lead his people to victory in a war that the king does not want. Includes an HDR presentation of the film, Dolby Atmos audio, original Mandarin English audio tracks, and a couple making of featurettes. I gotta tell you, this thing sounds really interesting to me. I gotta figure out a way to check this out. Mm. The film Finding Steve McQueen is being released. It's 1972, and a gang of close knit thieves from Youngstown, Ohio, attempt to steal $30 million in large illegal contributions and blackmail money from President Nixon's secret fund. Another film called The Vault is being released. It's a story about a group of small-time criminals in 1975, three years later, who attempt to pull off the biggest heist in American history, stealing over $30 million from the mafia and the smallest state in the Union. Which one is it, kids? What's the smallest state in the Union? Delaware. Rhode Island. Oh, Rhode Island. Yeah, no, I'm stupid. New to Blu-ray, Criterion is releasing The Inland Sea. In 1971, author and film scholar Donald Ritchie published a poetic travelogue about his explorations of the islands of Japan's Inland Sea, recording his search for traces of a traditional way of life as well as his own journey of self-discovery. Twenty years later, filmmaker Lucille Cara undertook a parallel trip inspired by Ritchie's by-then classic book, capturing images of hushed beauty and meeting people who still carried on the fading customs that Ritchie had observed. Includes a new 4K restored digital transfer, Superfied by the original cinematographer, new interviews with Kara, a new conversation between filmmaker Paul Schrader and cultural critic Ian Barama, as well as others. Shout Factory is releasing Vice Squad. This is the film starring Wings Hauser, Matt. Season Hoobly, who's also from Hardcore, stars as Princess, a single mom by day, a Hollywood prostitute by night. A volatile cop, Tom Walsh. Played by Gary Swanson, uses her trap uses her to trap a sadistic pimp named Ramrod. There's your wings, Hauser. Includes a brand new 4K restoration. From what I understand, this is supposed to be a really kind of crazy but not terribly good action film. One of those straight to DVD things from the 80s. A brand new 4K restoration, as I said, new audio commentary, a whole bunch of new interviews as well. Shout is also releasing Endless Love with a brand new 2K remaster from the film struck by an, from an interpositive. New audio commentary with the film historian Lee Gambin, as well as some interviews. Waking the Dead, the Jennifer Connelly Billy, Billy Crudup film, is being released on Blu ray for the first time. As is Fierce Creatures, the kind of sort of follow up to A Fish Called Wanda. Radio Land Murders, which was written by George Lucas. Dennis the Menace, and Another Snake Out, all being released on Blue. Your straight to DVD pick of the week, Matt, is Velocipaster. I think we may have mentioned this before, but I think it was delayed, so I wanted to remind everybody. He's a man of the claw. After losing his parents, a priest travels to China, where he inherits a mysterious ability that allows him to turn into a dinosaur. At first horrified by his new power, a prostitute, again, just I guess that's the theme of the week, convinces him to use it to fight crime and ninjas. Velocipaster. Matt, what should we be streaming this week? I'm going to recommend a kind of a cult film, Idiocracy. It stars Luke Wilson. He is uh, subject to a army experiment where he's put into suspended animation and he gets left. And instead of waking up in a year like he was supposed to, he wakes up 500 years later where he finds out that society's collective intelligence has discre- decreased so much that even though him as the average intelligence is the smartest man on the planet. And it's just kind of this send up of ridiculousness. And if you squint, you can kind of see the world today, which is kind of frightening how we're heading in that way. I don't know if you need to squint that hard. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's available on Hulu. That's it. Speaking of idiocracy, why don't we continue the show with a clip from my boys, Farrell and Riley, two guys who cannot do wrong with Holmes and Watson. Why would an innocent man agree to hang for Moriarty's crimes? Elementary. This man is terminally ill. Look at him. His pallid complexion. Palsy in his left hand. Wait, I know. He's an onanist. Yes. 
of the most enthusiastic kind. What's an onanist? He, let's see, he, he pours his own tea. He likes to create his own sauce. He is a saucier. And the name of his restaurant is Crotch Kitchen. On a daily basis, he creams his own eclair. He is Romeo and Juliet. That should do it. This here! Oh, oh, thank you! Sorry, ladies. And there you go. That's basically the film in a nutshell. That is Holmes <laughs> and Watson. Matt, why don't you explain what this film's about? I guess? Sure, as much as I can. And you should just realize that any time that Chris asked me to explain the film, it either has no plot or is really hard to explain. That's why he does it. So Holmes and Watson is about uh, Sherlock Holmes you know, chasing Moriarty for a change. Um, there's a murder in uh, Buckingham Palace while he's being honored. And they are basically trying to solve the the murder before the uh, Queen of England can be killed. Dun, dun, dun. And hilarity ensues? So this is written and directed by Eaton Cohen. Eaton Cohen actually wrote Idiocracy. How do you like that for some synergy? Yeah, that's, that's some real synergy right there. Also wrote Tropic Thunder. He wrote okay. Get Hard, which is that bad, feral... Kevin Hart movie. I saw that. Right. That is not good. And now Holmes and Watson. He also did Men in Black 3, the best of the franchise, but exceptionally low bar, and Madagascar 2. So sometimes what happens when you have a lot of really funny, smart people together is they do a lot of outtakes, right, in these comedy films. Mm -hmm. um, what's a good example? Of that? The House, I think, is a right. good example of that. Right. And then people will they'll choose the wrong the wrong clips, the wrong, you know, scenes, I think, and then assemble a film together. And I think that's part of the problem here. Maybe that's what happened. There are moments that I found funny, uh, like when they both yell for Miss Mrs. Um, Hudson. Hudson the first time. Yeah. And I come up with different reasons for her to come out. You know, there are <laughs> fleeting moments in here, which was very frustrating for me, mm. that I found it to be very funny. <clears throat> But they're very, they're very few and far in between, unfortunately. And the film doesn't feel rooted in any kind of comedic context. It's too unrestrained. Yeah. There's there the plot is barely there. It's just it's just a marker to kind of show that time has progressed in this movie, basically, I guess. And it's it just doesn't work. It's flat. If yeah. you want to go with an ana and what a uh, anachronistic. I'm not saying that word right, but a comedy where the kind of modern, how do you say that? Where modern stuff kind of shows up and past. Anachronistic. Time. Anachronistic. That's the word. Thank you. I'm game. But there were so many kind of unfunny moments. There were times too, I think, when they were joking about the state of medicine at the time. Mm -hmm. I think that worked out reasonably well. But overall, it's just it's just a real disappointment. It's just, the whole thing just basically falls flat. What are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I, I again completely agree with you. It's it's really just kind of boring and, and almost interminable. And I'm sitting there watching this thing, just like not laughing, getting bored, kind of looking off into getting distracted by everything around me. And it's just it's really a shame because I really like the two of them together, and I really yeah. like Will Ferrell, and he has just been putting out some real stinkers. Like the last like three or four films of his have just been they've been bad. And it does have its moments, but you're right. It, it can't elevate it. And I think they kind of lean too hard into some of the Guy Ritchie, Robert Downey Jr. aspects of the Sherlock Holmes thing with like yeah. kind of like slow down and all that kind of stuff, showing him doing the calculations. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like those movies are kind of old. I don't know if anybody's really going to kind of put the two and two together. It doesn't really seem like a really timely kind of thing. Although maybe it's all over elementary. I, never, I don't watch that show, so who knows? Or Sherlock. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's just bad and it's not funny and that's really that's really the kiss of death for a comedy. So I'm looking at Will's Ovra right now. And this is what it's been. So it's this year was Lego movie two. Mm -hmm. I feel a bit of a disappointment. That's not really his film. Sure. Daddy's Home Two. I haven't seen either of Daddy's Home movies. But then, then you have the house, Zoolander yep. Two, the first Daddy's Homes, Get Hard, the Lego movie, Anchorman Two. Okay. Yeah. The internship, the campaign, 
Casa de Mia Padre. Mi pa- All right. I kind of have a soft spot for that thing because it's just so <laughs> bizarre. I got to keep going, though. Everything must go is all right. Mega Mind. Here, the other guys, which yeah. is absolutely hilarious. Yeah. So nine years ago, he made his last truly good film without reservation, I think. Yeah. And it's got a great cast, too, right? Outside of those two guys, you have Rebecca Hall, Ralph Fine, Rob Brydon, Kelly McDonald, Steve Coogan, Lauren Lapkus. You know, Hugh Laurie pops up. You know, uh, even... Well, I don't want to spoil that for you. <laughs> it's just... Like I said, it's another case of just picking maybe all the wrong improv moments and just assembling a film together. Right. Part of me thinks that, like I said, they just didn't even have a script for this thing. They just had bullets that get get points they had to met, meet and then just film and then see what comes together. Yeah. And, and that's that's more. what all of his films are. They all feel that way. The ones that he, you know, but some of them are a lot more successful than others. I mean, I went back and watched Talladega Nights. It's the same style. It's just, It has no plot. It's just basically them riffing, you know, and that's that it. That one works. No, I understand it works, but I mean, I'm just saying that that seems to be his MO, and it's starting to not work more than it works. That's disappointing. What are you going to give this thing? I didn't hate it. Mm-hmm. I don't think I have enough hate in it to give it an F, so I'll give it a, I'll give it a D. I think I give it a D. All right. I'm going to give it a D plus just because of those, those few moments that I think really worked. You know what's funny is while I was cleaning and kind of getting everything ready, I, I actually started running it again. Yeah, and it's okay. It's not great. I pre I I was a little more patient with it, starting it over again. I'm about halfway through it. Yeah, as a, as a background movie, I don't know. I think it, I really just really enjoyed that scene with uh with Miss Hudson again. That's all. <laughs> but I've always liked Kelly McDonald too. I yeah no not a great week, folks. No, not good. Very bad. But we do good. it so you don't have to. There so you are. you're welcome. If you've had a chance to see Holmes and Watson, shoot us an email at feedback at the first run dot com. Matt, let's spend a few minutes and talk about our five favorite spin off movies. Here's one that didn't make the cut for me. Everywhere I go in this glorious state, people are talking about change. I say, why change? This is a great state founded on the principles of liberty. I don't want to change that. Our rightful citizens are hardworking Americans who earn their paychecks by the grit of their guts and the sweat of their brow. I don't want to change that. Change. That's what they want. Change. Change the laws. Open the doors. Red Rover, Red Rover. Let the terrorists come over. The jingle jangle of pennies in your pocket because the scavengers, the leeches, the parasites are walking away with your money while you're left with the change. So I want to say one more thing. Who are you going to vote for? You know, I had forgotten that Robert De Niro was in Machete. Oh. That's what it was, folks. That wasn't a political rally from this last couple of weeks. No, no, no. <laughs> that was De Niro about to be assassinated. And then Machete about to be framed. A spinoff from the Grindhouse series or film. Man, I wish that thing took off. I would love to have seen like a regular Grindhouse series, maybe every couple of years. But I still wish Halloween 3 worked and we got a different horror film every Halloween in a different genre. But yeah. you can't have everything, I guess. Yeah, what's weird is the ones that was probably one of the, the fake trailers that I was least interested to see. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would have loved to see Don't. Yes. Don't would be, it would be fantastic, but or we're never going to get it. Werewolf Women of the SS. Werewolf Women of the SS. Yeah, that would have been a good one too. So we did get Hobo with a shotgun, right? We did. Yes, we did. All right. Matt, actually, you went first last time. I'll go first to we'll give you the ultimate number one. So okay. my fifth favorite spinoff. I'm going to go with Creed. Okay. I think the uh, relaunch of the Rocky franchise. This time we have Michael B. Jordan playing the son of Apollo Creed. This is film is, of course, written and directed by Ryan Coogler, fresh off of Fruitvale Station, and then went on to do, of course, um, a little film called Black Panther. <laughs> Small the, film. Yeah. But Creed really works. It re- captures the spirit of the Rocky franchise and it adds a layer layer of respectability 
to the Rocky character that may have been lost over the years due to a bunch of subpar sequels. Though the Rocky Balboa film stands up pretty well. But Rocky V is just a mess. Though, to this day, I'll still quote, I didn't hear no bell. You know, with Tommy hits him in <laughs> with the thing. I didn't hear no, hear no bell, Tommy. Anyway, Creed just really encap- it just captures the spirit of those films. And, of course, you have Fantastic Turns by Jordan Stallone and, of course, Tessa Thompson. So... It's just a it's it is a loving nod to the franchise and a rebirth that unfortunately stumbles a bit with the sequel, but still creates my number five. All right, yeah, I was looking up for this. I was, I mean, when we suggested this, I, I nothing was immediately leaping to mind, and I was surprised at how few spinoffs there were. So this ought to be an interesting list. As was I. Uh, yeah, my number five is um, one we saw late last year, Bumblebee, yep. and I'm really gonna pick that because. It's really the only Transformers movie that I've seen that is actually not only tolerable, but actually I would hazard to say enjoyable. Haley Steinfeld is is a, a lot of fun. It brings a lot of the kind of Gen 1 Transformers, especially when you see them on Cybertron and what they look like then. You know, I actually had a, a good time with this. This is actually a pretty somehow film with some actual stakes and pathos even though it's basically a film about big robots punching each other that's a good pick that was my number five initially when i was putting my list together mm. i think the i'm a i'm a child of the 80s and though sometimes i felt like the nostalgia there was a little forced overall i still did enjoy it and it was great to actually see the transformers as they looked growing up as a kid right yeah showing that you see you can do that it doesn't have to be some almost impossible to follow action scenes we don't understand what's happening half the time on the screen it can Mm -hmm. be simpler and still be entertaining it's it's too bad too it's probably what the least successful film in the franchise and yet it's the best one yeah well it is too bad i didn't realize it didn't do that well i don't think it did okay my number four i think is going to be a little higher on matt's list i went back and forth on if this is a spinoff and it might not be, but I went with Deadpool. It's a spinoff of the X-Men franchise. Right. That's how I looked at it. Though he didn't appear. Well, he appeared in Wolverine, right? X-Men yeah. Origins. But X-Men this, Origins. And I think it's canon because he shows up in one of the Deadpool movies, right? So <laughs> He does. But the film perfectly captures Ryan Reynolds' charm. It's That's just perfect casting right there for that film. It is yeah. a S-ton of fun. Very funny exceptionally violent but enjoyable so uh deadpool is my number four all right so my number four is creed a solid film you know i didn't have high expectations going in seeing this thing um i'm not a huge fan of the rocky franchise although i do get a kind of campy delight out of the kind of uh, pulpy ridiculousness of rocky three and rocky four mm-hmm. but um this is actually this is actually a good solid film it's really a return to form whereas kind of like back to the first movie where it actually has some dramatic stakes and you know good performances all around it's not quite as cartoony and ridiculous do with that what you may but i think it's a it's a really good film solid film there you go my number three then is i believe it's the first spinoff in this franchise and it's the story of how we got the best star plans matt rogue one is my number three the most nihilistic of the star wars films because nobody makes it out alive but it's still really well done lots of great action you care about these characters and it's fun to see to kind of revisit this time in the star wars universe and we really finally 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 get a badass vader but it makes you when you watch the old films it's kind of like oh man why couldn't we get that then there's a i don't know if you've seen it you maybe sent it to me there is a video online i think i watched it on youtube yeah, of a, of where they kind of redo the Vader Kenobi fight. Yeah, and it's outside of some sketchy effects every now and then. Yeah, I think when they're basically trying to paste uh, um, Alec Guinness's face on whoever the actor is. Uh, still, the action part, those the fight scene, the choreography really works. Yeah, it does. And uh, Rogue One is just it's 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 a great little Star Wars action film roller coaster ride. I don't know if going with the original... From what I understand, it was supposed to be a lot darker, right, originally? Because, like, a, really a war film. Right. And Disney kind of balked at that. I'm curious right. if that would have been as entertaining if they went that route. But still, okay. it's my number three. 
All right. So my number three is another Star Wars spinoff. Um, it's Solo. Really? Um, yeah. I don't understand the hate for that film. I think it's a lot of fun. I think the reputation it has is undeserved. And like, I think a lot of it is just this backlash against the the new films, which I think is stupid in and of itself. But Donald Glover is great as True. as Lando Calrissian. The guy who plays Han is um, he's. You know, he does a, a good job. I mean, obviously, he's no Harrison Ford, but he does an adequate job, and I kind of bought into it, and I was kind of on board with the whole thing. Again, it's unfortunate we won't get any more of it, but, you know, I thought it was fine. Yeah, I totally would have been open to another film in that series. It is, is it entertaining enough, that's for sure. I don't know if it adds any real depth to the, to the franchise, but it's an entertaining little diversion. I'll definitely, and like you said, Glover is great in it. And I think as my, of course, now I'm blanking on her, um, but my possibly my favorite robot in the franchise, mm. Lando's partner, I guess. I'm not quite sure. But yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. It's weird is I, I've had no urge to revisit that film whatsoever, though. No? No. Maybe just, just check it out. You should check it out. It's available on, I think, on Netflix. So you should check it out and just see what you think. Fair enough. My number two, then, is... Is it the best film in the X-Men franchise? It might be. Though I still haven't watched the noir version of it, and that's the Hugh Jackman send-off to Wolverine and Logan. Uh, they finally do, too, the kind of the R-rated X-Men movie. Uh, Deadpool is R-rated, I think, kind of for a different thing, right? Because it's more his character and the vulgarity and the profanity and the violence. And this is more of a gritty kind of you know, lone samurai type Ronin thing for Logan. Much more so than the actual samurai Logan film, Wolverine movie was. But still, it's a fine send-off for Hugh Jackman's character. Um, It's brutal and gritty, and it's really well done. So I think out of all those spin-off films and the superhero ones, Logan is probably the best. Yeah, it's a good pick. So my number two, I'm going back to the Star Wars. Well, I'm going to say it's Rogue One. It's one of those things that when I watched it the first time, I liked it, but I didn't love it. But every time I catch it since then, I like it more. But I really like the fact that it kind of gives you kind of a visceral war feeling at the end. I love Badass Vader. It's probably my one of my favorite scenes of any of the Star Wars films. And, you know, I'm actually a big fan of Alan Tudyk's uh, a droid character. I don't remember his name either, but he's a lot of fun too. So Yeah, no, that's a good one. Obviously, because it was on my Obviously. list. It was on your list. My number one is a film that I don't think a lot of people realize is a spinoff because it became bigger than the original source film the character was featured in. And that is Blake Edwards' A Shot in the Dark from 1964. The sequel to the Black to the Black Panther. The sequel to the Pink Panther. Okay. So the original film focused more on David Niven, the jewel thief, and Peter Sellers and Spectre Clouseau kind of came in to solve it, but he wasn't technically the focus of the film david niven mm-hmm. was okay he was the titular pink panther and this though is the film where we focus on sellers and then just that whole universe explodes from there and they do a whole bunch of films afterwards and a shot in the dark from 1964 is still hilarious it's got style to boot a fantastic score from henry mancini and i think it's it's one of my favorite kind of mystery what do you want to call it uh comedy things it is a ton of fun if you haven't seen a shot in the dark i think it's the best in the panther series too so it's my number one okay yeah i've actually never seen a pink panther film i mean obviously i know peter sellers and and uh, the pink panther films but i've never uh i've never actually seen any of them so see at least go. a shot in the dark okay yeah all right all right, well, my number one is actually Chris's number two. I went with Logan. It was probably, I think it was my favorite superhero film of the of that year. It's definitely the strongest of the X-Men films. I think it's going to stand the test. I think that's going to be one that's going to be held up, or at least it's going to, you know, kind of maintain its it, what it's got. Because it's not, it's not really over the top. It's really kind of gritty and kind of down to earth. And it's not as much as, you know, people with superpowers can be. And I think it's going to age well. I think it's really good. It's it's kind of a fitting send off for the character. Yeah, of course it is. My number two. Mm-hmm. So did you have any honorable mentions? I had Lego Batman, which was funny enough, which was fun yeah. enough from the Lego Boot movie. And I've also put Annabelle Creation, um, mm-hmm. which again, I will go to is more fun than it has any right to be. For sure. I also had Borat, 
which is mm. I think a spinoff of the of the TV show. I don't know if yeah, that counts. Al, the right. Ollie the Ollie G show. Yeah. yeah. Um, into the Spider Verse does that count as a spinoff? I don't. I don't know. Think so get him to the know. Greek, which is a technically a spinoff of Knocked Up. Right. Yeah. It's in the same universe. Uh, or again, forgetting forgetting Sarah Marshall. Okay, thank you. And then yeah. uh, Finding Dory, I think, does that count, right? It's a spinoff of Finding Nemo. I guess, yeah, it's not really a sequel, a so yeah. Se- okay. Yeah, so, All right. and like I said, the Wolverine, Bumblebee, and then Born Legacy, the Renner film. Mm. It's not as horrible as everybody says it is. Right. In fact, there it may go. be better than the last Born film. That last one is <laughs> not good. It's too bad. I really like those first three Born films. Yeah. So what's your favorite spinoff film? Shoot us an email at feedback at the first to run dot com. Coming up next week on the big show, it's scary stories to tell in the dark. Produced Looking forward by, to it. Yeah, yeah, as am I. Produced by uh, Guillermo del Toro, who recently got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I don't know if you saw it, Matt. I actually tweeted out. It was really sweet what he did. So you should check that out if you haven't seen it. And then we're going back and forth. I've seen The Farewell. So I don't know if we're going to do that as well as, what is it? What is it? Murder. Memories of a Murder. Memories of a Murder. Yeah. Which is currently on streaming on Amazon Prime. So uh, we may do all three. We'll see how it all shakes out. Check us out at thefirstrun.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just do a search for The First Run. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Eventually you will find us. Go over to Apple Podcasts and give us a quick review. I will read it here on the air, of course. And it helps other people find the show. Matt, how about we take an extended break and we will see you all soon. Uh-huh.